hello again, everyone. Welcome to another session from uh, Microsoft Learn Azure Zero to Hero uh, monthly sessions. So today we have Tushar Kumar with us, and uh, he'll be talking about Adapt Cloud with Confidence and Defender for Cloud. Uh, he's Microsoft MVP in Azure Networking Infrastructure and Security. Uh, I'm not going to take that much of the time for the introduction and we'll quickly dive into uh, the, the introduction of the next slide. So you can scan the QR code for the links uh, and joining to the to the community uh, channels. So it is learning rooms on Microsoft Learn, uh, LinkedIn and YouTube channel. So we have also aka.ms uh, slash join Azure Zero to Hero uh, that you can quickly join to the learning rooms. So what is Microsoft Learn? Uh, as we all, always try to share in all of the sessions, so try to set it your homepage while we are in this path. So trying to learn every day, even uh, with small knowledge of, small dose of, dosage of the, uh, the knowledge in a daily basis would be resulting in a really great stuff. So Microsoft Learn uh, is a rich place for the content for the cloud services, AI services nowadays that you can find customized learning paths, training paths that you can start to follow. You can do um, uh, test uh, uh, exams for before preparing for your actual exam like exams actually. So you can actually see what's, uh, what's uh, waiting for you in the actual exam before going for it. So uh, we have learning rooms, learning rooms, uh, learning learning room tech communities within Microsoft Learn, which we gather together with all Microsoft Learn experts, uh, MVPs, MCTs, Microsoft employees, together with all uh, learners that currently we have within learning rooms with uh, more than 2,500. So we are so proud of it and uh, happy that we can have all these beautiful sessions with uh, professionals like. Tushar, that today we have together with us, not just you uh, as a learner, as a professional in this session, we also learned a lot from you. So you know, we have these sessions here, or uh, sorry, the links in the previous slide. Uh, say if we go, uh, yeah, here you can use uh, those uh, aka.ms uh, links to check for the learn community, Microsoft Learn community, and also checking for the learning rooms. Uh, don't forget to sign up for Microsoft Learn Cloud Skills Challenge, but this time it is about Microsoft AI services. Uh, and uh, at the end of the every challenge that you finish, you'll be eligible for 50% of a cost uh, for Microsoft certification exam, and you will also get uh, a recognition via the email that you finish that uh, uh, that challenge, and you will also have it in your Microsoft Learn profile transcript. Um, once, while Microsoft as a leader in uh, AI market in today's world, so it is really important that uh, we also learn beside the other cloud uh, services because it is going integrated every day more and more. So uh, we absolutely recommend that you visit Microsoft Learn Cloud Skills Challenge and register for all of them or at least for one of the AI Skills Challenge and try to learn more about it. And uh, last but not least, uh, our slide is about code of conduct we have for the learning room. So um, we always try to be a friendly environment and to be aware, aware of each other and be patient and welcoming and respectful to each other and opening for all questions and viewpoints and understanding differences. So thank you for joining. I'm gonna handing the, uh, this stage to Tushar and uh, Thank you. Yeah, uh, Tushar, sure, before you, you start, sorry, uh, the things that uh, Hamid forgot to mention, we have a best question competition. So don't forget to ask your best question from Tushar. And at the end of the session, Tushar will select the best question and we will provide you a 50% discount voucher for Microsoft exam fundamentals. So uh, don't forget to ask your questions. Tushar, take over, please. Yeah, make sure it's not the hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, I'll just take over the screen. One second. I hope my screen is visible to everyone. Yes. Perfect. Give me one second, and there you go. 
OK, so hello everyone. A very good morning, good afternoon, good evening from whatever time zone that you are joining in. Uh, today's session is going to be about how we adopt cloud with confidence and what's going to be Defender for Crowd's role in this overall adoption journey. OK, a little bit about myself and Hamid has already given a quick brief. So my name is Tushar Kumar. I'm cloud security lead working with Codec Ireland at the moment. I am uh, Microsoft MVP is as in uh, networking infrastructure and security. And I work day in, day out with customers around planning their Azure state and uh, making sure they are moving to Azure in secure in secure way and a proper governed way. OK, a quick view of today's agenda is going to be what exactly is Defender of a Cloud, which is going to be a quick overview. Then we are going to look at what is Defender CSPM. Don't worry about the acronyms. We are going to talk about those in detail. We are going to look at Defender for containers. We are going to look at Defender available for storage at, and as well as databases. What's there called uh, JIT, which is just in time access, and uh, then a couple of pieces around operationalizing Defender. OK, so before we start, there is always a quick question that I ask, OK, which is basically, do you think with all of these and uh, all of these areas, being it a car, being it a motorbike, being it a jet, the security controls remain the same, OK? It, it it's not true. OK, the reason being if you're building a car, you need to understand what exactly is going to be the end product. So if it is a car, you will have different sort of security controls. If it is a motorbike, it will put you'll have a different sort of uh, security controls. If you are building a jet, then again, it's going to be a different set of uh, security controls. So before diving into anything before understand before getting into deployment of anything or designing anything we need to understand what's our end goal is okay the safety requirements for anything like let's say it is a car it will be like uh, having airbags all four seats it will be like a different uh, like side collision front collision detections and all those other good stuff i'm not i'm not very good at this but yeah <laughs> but you'll have all those all those uh, different security measures. Same as the motorbike, you'll get uh, maybe front wheel ABS, speed sensors, or uh, maybe some some fluid detection or something, or uh, rear radar kind of stuff when you're building a motorbike. So that basically combines the security features what you need for a bike. If you start putting an airbag in a motorbike, I I don't think so. That's gonna end well for you. Like you will be you will be thrown out of the bike by the airbag itself. That same goes if you're building a jet. You cannot uh, rely on having an airbag or you having the front sensor because of the overall requirement. I'm not a jet, jet expert, so I cannot I cannot tell you what all security measures that we take in there. But yeah, but you, the requirements will be different and the set of tools that you will be using will be different. OK, now in order to understand uh, the overall scenario, we have a quick. Uh, I'll say we have a quick scenario. With what we are going to look at, which is basically we are going to talk about company Y and there is a specific, you know, or everyone knows the reason why we cannot take company X. So Tom is our guy. You can see he see him here is starting a digital transformation. OK, so when you're looking at a digital transformation, first thing that you go for Microsoft perspective is cloud adoption framework. So this this must be really familiar for you if you have ever seen Microsoft's cloud adoption framework, right? So it goes from defining the strategy where you define what all things you need to do and business justification, costing, and all, all those all those good stuff. Those good gets into planning. Then you go into ready mode where you deploy a few things, and then you go into adopt where you move all the states. So that's a topic of its own. But when you look at this, basically the whole cloud adoption framework is defined in multiple stages okay in parallel to that what you have is three different stages so if you see the arrows goes all the way from here to here and secure is going to be one of the key areas for that okay so 
Our guy Tom started the digital transformation. He started following our cloud adoption framework, but there was a big concern of security. OK, then he thought, OK, this is some Azure problem. OK, I'm moving to cloud and I have seen like a lot of people who are getting like uh, new to cloud. They say, OK, I'm, I'm putting things. I'm putting my server on cloud and uh, now security is not my concern. Microsoft is going to take care of that or uh, I've seen this in multiple customers. OK, so. When you look at the cloud option framework, this is something you get as concerned that OK, I have to manage that. I have to look at what is there, what's not there. So in that case. Okay, yeah, so in that case, he starts looking at what exactly he has and he want to look at other cloud providers as well. OK, so the company wide landscape at this point of time is consisting of storage resources, which is some databases, uh, some storage. You have some code repositories sitting in there. They are planning to go with infrastructure as a code approach. They have plan to go with platform as a service components. They have some containerized applications. They have some infrastructure components, your VMs, your regular network uh, and all. They're thinking about going for a multi cloud setup as well. And they want to adopt the overall DevSecOps process. In, in order to do all that, there is a big giant also sitting in the corner, which is your compliance team. Once you move there and, and you have all the controls in place or not, so you have the compliance obligation for the company Y as well. OK, so. Coming back to the previous question, so the our guy thought let's look at the other providers, what they are saying. So irrespective of the well architected framework or cloud adoption framework for any cloud provider, being it an Amazon Web Services, being in with uh, Microsoft Azure, being in cloud GCP, you will find a common pillar, which is security. So security is basically going to stay in there and you have to look at that no matter what. Moving along, so basically why there is a security, OK? The reason being the moment you start adopting new technologies, the moment you start moving to cloud, getting into more of uh, let's say past services, AI services, and uh, these days like everyone is going for open AI and all, all other stuff. Once you start getting those services, the value realization within your organization will be quite high. OK, so today we are sitting in. So today we are sitting manually inputting it. We're basically input. We are doing a manual data entry job from looking at uh, some forms and then that got automated with OpenAI or maybe with OCR technologies. And now we are seeing productivity increase. So the, the value realization is quite high. You'll see that it's get started. You have the value. You have you're getting more value and then comes the big issue, which is all the increased risks and increased threats, which is going to push you down because you're not having earlier on. You had a fully like uh, I'll say contained environment. You were not sending anything. Now you have a requirement to keep it with uh, your. You are interacting with large language model. You are putting it in cloud that can be misconfigurations as well. So those increased risks are going to basically reduce the value realization in order to make sure that you push that value realization and you make sure that you have a proper you have a proper security in place and it is not blocking people from working in the in day to day environment right we go with the new controls and the new, uh, new controls approach okay and that's what we are going to talk about defender for cloud so our guy tom he starts looking at defender for cloud OK, so what Defender for Cloud gives you is first thing is it gives you unified security around your DevOps. Second thing is it will give you a cloud security posture management, and that's what the first topic that we talked about CSPAM. Uh, third thing that it is giving you is protection for your cloud workload. So whatever workloads that you are going to put in, this is going to help you out with that. OK. So you got all these, you got workload protection, you got DevOps protection, you got a cloud security posture management. We're going to talk about cloud security posture management. It's coming quite often. So 
And in the bottom of this, right, you must have been seeing there is multiple logos and, and why do we have it here? The reason being like we can onboard, we can use Defender for Cloud in order to make sure we have proper uh, security around AWS, Azure, GCP, and as well as your on-premises infrastructure as well. So basically what Defender for Cloud gives you a full suit of product, a full suit of services that you can even extend to other clouds as well. Okay, now moving along how it is different. Okay, so basically the difference between Defender for Cloud and the other products that are available is going to be more around how it supports the multi-cloud where you have uh, all different clouds covered as well. Also, you can put a benchmarks around it. There will be a streamlined process of auto provisioning the, the agents as well as uh, the security best practices on the new resources that you are going to deploy in. It gives you a full view of your security posture from identifying the risks, it, it giving you a full attack path analysis and giving you a full view of how your systems can be vulnerable there. And it's end-to-end -end life cycle protection. And the reason why I'm saying end-to-end -end life cycle protection, so let's say you are going with a DevOps approach of deploying your resources. So anything, your code sitting in your DevOps, your IAC, your infrastructure as a code is getting scanned there where you get if there is any vulnerabilities, if there is any issues, it is getting back, you're getting back uh, that in Defender. Once you deploy that, post that, the services which is going to be around Defender uh, for workloads, which basically going to help you out in operationalizing in, in operations as well as once you have deployed them, looking at if their posture is correct or not. Okay, so that's basically a quick view how it looks different from other products. And now we'll start looking at the pieces of this, which is first thing we'll start with how it does a unified DevOps security and management. So the DevOps security posture, as you can see over here, it will show you what all vulnerabilities that we have in here and uh, looking at the code, what code scannings and uh, what all, if there is any exports, uh, exposed secrets, if there is any recommendations that it has specifically. It also checks for any OSS vulnerabilities. If there is any op open source vulnerabilities, you can check that as well. You have the coverage over here for GitHub, Azure DevOps. And uh, and GitLab as well. If you go in with the, if you go in with this, what will happen is for all the repositories or, or uh, all the projects that you have within the DevOps, you can you can actually onboard those into DevOps, and basically you can see the security posture. And each and every one of those will basically come in here, and you'll see if there is any. You'll get a pretty dashboard which is going to give you. A a view on what all things is up there. OK, now the question will be, now we have all these, like I need the remediation steps as well, right? So with all the findings that it will give, right, it will give you an option over here, which is basically going to say what is going to be the remediation step for that, what all security checks it has done, what all findings that you, are, you can see here, and even the severity of that. So if there is something which is a high severity of that, you will definitely tackle that first before going to the medium or low uh, severities. OK, that's basically going to cover overall posture of this. Now, do we need to do this manually every time we have we want to do our scan? What you can do is you can basically automate that by keeping it uh, basically uh, by making the configuration, which will basically do any pull request that you merge in. You, you point it to a master branch, any pull request that you uh, that you do into that particular branch, it will it will run that that particular service and it will give you all the specific vulnerabilities. So we don't want if Tashar is working somewhere in his laptop or in, is in is in branch and he's copying data, he's copying some vulnerable code from somewhere and putting it uh, in the application code, right? We don't want to check that unless he pushes the same code there without removing that vulnerability or without making uh, any changes to it. So basically what will happen is once you once that code gets merged into the whatever production branch or master branch that you will have, it will it will run that and it will give you an overall scan. 
Okay. So next one is going to be our Defender of the Cloud, which is more of our cloud security posture management. Okay. So cloud security posture management, the name suggests what exactly it does. Okay. So it tells you what is the security posture of your overall environment. Okay. How your environment is doing in terms of security, if there is any loose ends, if there is any issues with the environment in terms of security. And Earlier on, like if you have asked me, I'm not sure what was the release time of this, but if you asked me a year back, there was no like segregation on this one. So, but now there is uh, two basic plans, two plans we have basically for uh, Defender for Cloud CSPM, which is one is called foundational and the foundational actually supports only three things, which is uh, recommendation for any any weaknesses, providing secure score and uh, continuous assessment of any configuration of your cloud resources. OK, on top of that, now you have Defender for CSPM plan, which basically gives you uh, which gives you additional functionalities like looking at the governance of our environment, making sure you have the regulatory compliances met. There is a feature called Cloud, Secu uh, cloud Security Explorer. We'll see that in, co in coming uh, few minutes. Uh, we have Attack Pass Analysis, which is basically we are going to see that as well, which basically gives you how uh, an attacker can get into your environment and also an agentless scanning of your machine. So which is basically uh, an agentless virtual vulnerability scanning of your virtual machines. OK, so. And all of that happens within your Azure environment, so you can see it's 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 basically you'll it, you'll see something similar to this in coming coming slides as well. So this is the view that you get from Defender for Cloud, which is basically first thing is going to show you the secure score, what is the regulatory compliance score you have, uh, what's the inventory of uh, machines that you have, and what's the Defender score you have with in there. Okay, so. The basically, we'll start with the secure score dashboard, right? So secure score is nothing but it says what exactly is the status of your overall environment. So your overall environment, let's say if it is 90% secure, that means you have really less recommendations or if you have like really less uh, points to be fixed, okay? The better the secure, the better secure score you have, the more secure your environment is. OK, in some cases it definitely gives you uh, in, in like uh, recommendations around the best practices that this is how it should be, but you have some different measures into it. But we'll see that we can we can always exempt those or we can make sure that uh, that's not popping up and not affecting our secure score. OK, so. As you can see, if you go, if you dig into any of the any of the resources, you will see there is a, a couple of remediation vulnerability remediation, which is potentially impacting nine percent of the score, and uh, you have like most of the resources impacted with this. There is only one resource or two resource that you have here. So this is fifty six resources are unhealthy, and sixty seven resources are uh, out of sixty seven resources. Sorry. So it goes all the way. You will see all the recommendations that what exactly is coming in. You can see exactly what all basic, uh, basically the remediations are. You'll find a really good thing over here which says quick fix. OK, and this quick fix is basically the magic button which can make this recommendation go away and fix that in your environment. So basically there is a lot of uh, common things, the likes of uh, adding some policies or making like uh, uh, some agent installations or uh, common SQL vulnerabilities. What it, what it has is is this quick fix button. You'll find that in most of the most uh, in, in most of these kind of recommendations, you can just simply go and click quick fix and it will go back fix that in your server, fix that in your past service, and you will be good to go. That recommendation will go away. You'll see that in the green. OK, same. You can see basically all the affected resources. So if you go on any specific, so let's say log analytics resources should be installed. So you'll see what all uh, what all machines that you want to pick in from that. And if let's say it is not quick fix you will always get the remediation logic or uh, you'll get this you'll get the aut automation script for those that you can utilize you can run those script and it will do the job for you 
please note this is not going to be for every cases because the reason being you cannot fix everything uh, like it, even from uh, your from your environment perspective you will not want a quick fix button for everything because it might close up something or you might have configured it in a different way for a specific uh, for your specific application but most of the common ones the likes of log analytics agents should be installed just so you have a proper logging structure and uh, <coughs> let's say defender agent should be there so those kind of recommendations you will get there okay yeah that's more of uh, looking at what is the security posture and now let's talk about a little bit of attack path analysis so within defender portal you have an option which basically called attack path analysis and what it says is just zoom in here so Attack path analysis is basically going to give you what all that it, it's the name is quite uh, self explanatory that what all attack paths are available within your environment. So what all things can be exposed based on based on your cloud security posture. So if you can see here, we have a VM with high vulnerability and that has read permission to key vault. So you have a virtual machine sitting in your environment which is vulnerable. That virtual machine with managed system identity have access to a key vault sitting in your environment, which might or might not have a secret sitting there, or maybe your global admin password, maybe someone has put in there, or maybe secret to your application or uh, your app or your any of your uh, uh, enterprise apps which is sitting in there, and you are not aware of that. So this virtual machine. This virtual machine that we have here can actually impact your key vault as well. So, so basically, this is how you will see this, and it's basically a screenshot of uh, a better example, I'll say, which is more of there's an internet exposed machine. So we are talking about this guy here. So that's a network interface of an internet exposed machine which is sitting in this subnet in under is this uh, virtual network. So and it goes into it, it. It has a public IP sitting in there, which is. Which is basically not protected. So what you what attackers can do is if they they are able to get into this machine using this public IP address on top. You will they will be able to traverse their uh, traffic to this this particular subnet and that can go into this virtual network itself. Even further down, if there is more like let's say your net uh, your uh, on premises network is connected, it will show you that OK, that it can go to the local like local uh, network as well. And basically what you'll see is it, that it can go to your on premises network. So here. What we are seeing here is just because the VM has high vulnerability, OK, and it has a public IPS attached to it as well, it can be a security threat for you. So basically, that's your security posture issue. You need to fix that. You need to make sure your virtual machine is what this virtual machine is. The vulnerability is remediated and mostly that comes with the, the latest updates. And once you put in the latest updates, you will have that. Or maybe if there is a directive from Microsoft, if there is any specifics of registry that you need to change, you need to make sure you are changing that. OK, so that basically gives you a full view. Now talking more in terms of the workload protection, the third pillar that we said. OK, so we had we, we talked about this. We talked about this guy. Now the third one is more of a work cloud workload protection. OK, so cloud workload protection is going to cover like I'll say most of the services at this point of time. If there is any specific service, uh, you can always check the Microsoft website and it, it has a list of services there which will help you out understanding if there is a defender available for that or not but it's a, it covers most of the services around any servers being it uh, different flavors of my of linux or uh, windows uh, azure virtual machine scale sets any kts or uh, any kubernetes clusters you have you have if let's say unmanaged kts that's also covered in there app services 
that's mostly around the compute service layer, compute layer on more on a service layer wherein you are looking at uh, your network, you're looking at key vaults, even for resource managers. So anything that is getting deployed or uh, let's say when you're running an ISE script or when you're running PowerShell script as a CLI, so the resource manager gets involved. So you have defenders or anything malicious happening in there that can get uh, that can get uh, basically cut, cut, uh, cut. OK, so and uh, also around databases for blob storage, your ADLS, uh, your file storage, any MariaDB, Cosmos DB. So this is like a, a short list that we are looking at. And uh, anytime that when you're doing an implementation, you can check what exactly is available because there is a lot of preview features as well available at the moment. And same for if you look at specifics of Amazon Web Services, GCP, and your on-premises workloads. OK, there are caveats into that, that how you can onboard those, how you can uh, onboard the servers that are sitting in a because you can see here the AWS workloads we are talking about. It doesn't have servers, but we'll talk about that in coming slides with where we'll talk about how we can onboard a server into it, but it basically covers most of the fit functionalities and uh, around AWS and GCP as well. OK, let's move along. So we'll see a quickly. Uh, there is a couple of features that is, I'll say, mostly asked by the customers and uh, I've tried that, which is around Defender for Containers. What it provides you around Defender for Containers is having a containers vulnerability assessment, having a runtime protection, which is basically giving you an uh, agentless way of uh, detecting any any sort of suspicious behavior or suspicious activity. Also, uh, it gives you a container hygiene as well, which is basically uh, recommending in reference to the Azure security benchmark that OK, if there is any uh, issue with the, your container <coughs> container instances. Same for enforcing the policies on specific of Kubernetes uh, to, to your to, to your Kubernetes workloads as well. OK, that's a quick brief of what you get within the Defender for Containers. Then comes the Defender for Databases. OK, so you have Defender for Databases. You have uh, support for other databases as well. We'll just uh, specifically talk about SQL piece over here, which is which gets more of a, a traction. So Azure SQL database, Azure SQL Manage Instance, Azure Synapse, or SQL sitting on your Azure VM, that can be straight away one click onboarding to base uh, our Defender for Cloud. And you can go with Defender for SQL in the, into it. The machines that are not there, that uh, the machines that are sitting in a different environment or other clouds that we talked about, right? You can always use Azure Arc which will basically which is basically a hybrid cloud and ma management tool so you can use azure arc to onboard these to azure and what will happen is then you can onboard them to defender for cloud and you'll get a uh, defender for databases on that okay once you have Defender for Databases onboarded, what will happen is you'll start getting all the security incident and as well as the security recommendation for those. So if you see the security incident detected there, that's basically giving you a f that's that's basically giving you what all suspicious activities uh, are executed. If there is suspicious activity on that, there is brute force attack on the SQL. The, there is a potential secure SQL injection as well that you can see uh here and then based on that what you can do is you can do uh, more of a uh, investigation on that you can look at what all happened if there is any uh if there is any sort of uh, breach on that one you need to define <laughs> you need to basically see that and uh, what is the vulnerable statement that was run on that and there is an option over here which says take action which basically gives you the remediation steps so the take action option is going to give you how you can mitigate that threat okay what all future attacks that can happen to this and that's basically coming from this particular machine and uh, this particular machine and you can always like these 
all of these, we are going to talk about this. There is a good button here called Trigger Logic App, which is basically the workflow automation. So common errors, common issues that you that you see, you can always automate those as well. And we are going to talk about that in coming slides. OK. Uh, more of that was more of uh, looking at the, the databases and uh, looking at what all things can go wrong if there is any issues with those or or not. You can also do a vulnerability assessment of your uh, SQL servers and you'll get the SQL vulnerability checks as well, which is basically uh, all the specifics like what you can do. There, there is DBO being used for uh, normal operations, so you should not be using that. You are not using uh, it and you're not tracking your users. So these kind of these kind of uh, security checks it gives you and it gives you a vulnerability assessment on top of that. And basically you get the proper description of all that, which exactly benchmark it is violating and what all databases is uh, vulnerable to that. And that basically is all categorized based on the specifics, areas, attack surface reduction, uh, data protection, logging and auditing, and you have all the areas around that. OK, the next one, and uh, this was a really, really long awaited feature, and, and uh, I can tell you I have uh, this was customers have been asking this from me like six, seven years back as well when we when we propose Azure Blob Storage, when we propose uh, Azure Storage fun uh, functionalities, right? So they always ask, okay, if there is any option to do uh, scanning of the storage, if if we can do uh, malware uh, detection on that, if we can put malware detection on our storage accounts or all those. So basically, Defender for Storage is one good thing that came in and basically it came in with this functionality which basically is going to give you a malware protection on different on your storage accounts so what it gives you is it gives you a full view of if there is any suspicious access patterns any anonymous access coming in if there is any uh if there is any content access from known malicious ip addresses you will get those if <coughs> Same as if there is an unusual amount of data extracted, if there is an unusual inspection of your data and uh, unusual change in your access permissions as well, you will get that alerting as well. And on top of that, what you will get is you, you will see if there is any upload of malicious content. So you can always go with. Uh, <coughs> you can always go with the. Uh, the malware detection what it does is it's going to give you a full view of it it's going to alert you if there is any malware got uploaded if you have an application sitting in there which is uploading data to a blob storage in the back of it so it doesn't sit there it moves out somewhere or maybe for you to re review or based on your playbook what it will do is it will delete that or clear that out straight away okay the detection and remediation, the way it works is it, it gets enabled one way, one click. So it's basically you just have to do one click and it is it will be enabled for your defender for storage. Anything that it gets, it goes to your sick it, it the security alert goes to defender for cloud. You can even even further you can integrate that with Sentinel and you can integrate that with once you have that integrated with Sentinel, you can use Sentinel playbook to do automated response as well. And in the end, voila, you have the threat remediated. So that's basically more of a detection and response. If we see that in the portal itself, so this is how it looks when you see if there is a potential malware uploaded in your soft in your storage blob container, and based on that, it will give you an alert. Uh, same for you'll see what else attack storage. You can see the file hash if there is any and why it is being uh, basically why it is being marked as a, a, a malware. You'll see the, the all, all the background in the back of it as well. And it will give you where exactly the IP where it, it came from, just so your security team can do the correlation and see if there is any lateral movement from this or if there is any anyone who has downloaded this or used this uh, with the same signature. OK, this is one 
really nice feature and uh, everyone here, if you have worked with Azure, you might have created a virtual machine at some point of time and you're using uh, it for some purpose for your application or maybe just for a jump box or maybe for for some sort of reason. OK, so what you can do is there is always a just in time VM access option that you get from the Defender itself. You can see what our servers are in, is in in there. What what exactly you have in there, and then what you can do is you can actually get a just in time access. And by just in time, what I mean is you get an option to define how many hours or uh, what exactly is the time frame that you want to uh, go for. If you just want it from your IP, so three three eight nine is the port that you use for RDPing into it. 22 is for uh, definitely your Linux boxes. 5985, 5986, all those ports uh, this for the specific usage. You can actually enable that for just in time, which is basically, let's say, three hours, two hours, one hour, and you can enable that. It will get enabled for just for your IP. And after two hours, once it is expired, it will get removed and you'll not be able to access that. Then you have to do it, raise another request. So basically, you just have to put that on. You just have to define how many hours that you want, want it for, and you will be good to go. OK. Next one is more of an adaptive application control. So you have two functionalities here. One is adaptive network hardening, and one is adaptive application controls. So whenever you have Defender on servers, you can actually control what all applications or uh, what all applications can run on those and if there is any other application then your verified uh, or maybe your allowed list is running you can either audit that you can block that and same goes for the network it basically does the network hardening which basically gives you a, a ability so what you can do is at any point of time if there is any like open flow between machines which is not required or uh, it gives you recommendations around that if there is over I'll say over permission in network side from one to one to other location. OK, moving along for, with this, you will see uh, with the adaptive application controls, what you can do is you can see it based on the, the resource grouping here. What all exactly is the groups in there? And based on that, you can actually push out. OK, the allowed. This is the allowed list that you have, and this is the allowed locations that you have. And uh, also you can you can put in the allowed uh, rules as well. OK, now we are moving along to the final part of this, which is basically operationalizing Defender for Cloud, right? So we have all the functionalities. We have thought of that. We have we are looking at everything and. Once we have everything, now we want to look at how we want to how we enable that within our environment, how we start using that within our environment. OK, so <clears throat> using that in your environment is going to be two way. One is going to be from Defender for Cloud. Port for on, on the Azure portal itself, you will get a one click enablement, uh, one click enablement for all the Azure resources that you have for non Azure resources because uh, I just have this because non Azure resources where the actual challenge comes in with how you how you're going to enable that. So, and that's where actually Azure Arc comes into the picture. And and, and a lot of you, if you have seen uh, Windows Server 2008 going sunset and uh, 2012 going sunset, right? Azure Arc gained a lot of traction because Microsoft is even providing extended support once you onboard your servers at to Azure using Azure Arc. So Azure Arc is just going to give you an ape capability. So what will happen is your, let's say this is your data center, this is your Kubernetes, this is your uh, SQL machine, or this is your normal virtual machine. With the help of Azure Arc, what you will be doing is you will make them, just as in the simple term, in layman terms, you'll make them visible to Azure. OK, so there'll be an agent going on on each of these and what it will do is it will connect that to the Azure Resource Manager plane so you can manage that Azure resource. Uh, you can manage that resource as an as an Azure res uh, resource. OK, so that will look like. 
an Azure resource, but with some limited functionalities and with a different colored icon as well. So you can do like a push of agents, likes of log and log analytics agents. You can also enforce policies. So if you have ever worked with uh, policies around uh, your overall landing zone or maybe a specific VM policies, or maybe you have like how the VM should be defined and all those policies. So and that's where it helps really in cloud adoption. So you have some set of policies that you follow in your on premises environment. You take that, you you package that up, put it in terms of Azure policies. You onboard the remaining servers. So let's say you have your half of a state is running on cloud, half of a state is running on premises. You can always manage those from one place, which is going to be the Azure management portal. And also you can enforce the policies. You can enforce uh, basically all the all the specifics of your policies onto those as well. And a good thing is it will basically help you out in extending your identity as well. So all those servers will be able to communicate to each other with the uh, so let's say you create a logic app. OK, we talked about logic app in previous, which is going to uh, resolve some security remediation that will be able to use managed system identity to to connect to your on-premises resource or AWS or GCP resource. OK, so the next thing we are going to talk about the same is going to be more on the logic apps, how it is, how it can be defined, how you are, how you can make sure that there is an automated trigger happens if there, it, it runs, if there is any vulnerability found or if there is any specific recommendation you have. So there is an option called workflow automation. You go with the workflow automation and what it does is it gives you a full view of a uh, list of resources and we'll see that here. So there you go. So you have the workflow automation. What it what you do is you put in the names or you put in the descriptions and then and you go in there, you will see what exactly is in there. So you'll see what the, all the resources that you have onboarded to your Azure uh, Defender for Cloud. And based on that, if there is any specific sort of uh, recommendation, so like let's say system updates, what you what do you want to do is you want to send out a notification, you want to send out, uh, or maybe you want to trigger an update management to do that remediation or any sort of specific. So let's say you have this logic app created, which is going to be send notification by email. So if there is a vulnerability found, which says your updates, updates should be installed on your machines. So someone has missed their update cycle. They have to, you don't have a proper update uh, management configured on those, or maybe update management failed for some reason. In that case, it will trigger automatically notification to whoever, like to your security team, your admin team, and you'll be able to resolve that. Also, you can make it, uh, you can make the logic. So if you have ever worked with logic apps, logic app is a really, really amazing tool. So it, what it does is it works on all the logics. So you put in your, this is going to be your entry point. If this happens, do this. If this happens, do that. In that case, you can always automate that. The, the sky is the limit. You can make anything out of a logic app. It can do like a full cleanup, de delete. You can put in some, uh, automation policies which will just uh, delete the machine create a new machine install everything that's that's basically up to you you the, as much automation that you want you need to do the code up after that but that's gonna basically make sure any security recommendation that is coming in or if there is any alert uh, security issue that comes in alert comes in it goes in and it straight away changes that particular thing or maybe takes action automatically on that OK, so that's basically more of a workflow automation and we can do as, as I talked about the alert. We talked about the recommendation and basically it gives you all, the, all of that. All the good thing is you can actually make sure that everything that you do here goes into some sort of mechanism so you can basically automate the post process of, uh, of the response. So basically you can integrate it with Outlook teams just so you're let's say you have a service desk which is working on this if there is anything happen or if there is anything that popped in to your defender for cloud 
there is a team's notification gets sent out or maybe a team channel gets created that's uh, that's the integration with that you can go with specific of uh, slack you can go with service now ticket to be created you can also extend that to microsoft sentinel as well so you have all your uh, you have all your alerts at one place you have all your issues and marked over there perfect yeah so that's where we have made it operationalize all the resources we have onboarded with Azure Arc for anything that is sitting outside of our uh, environment. If there is anything that is sitting uh, within Azure, you just go and defend of a cloud and you'll be able to do that. And if you want to integrate it with your further on down the line, your service uh, management applications or your service towers, you can actually make that as well with ServiceNow Slack Teams integrations as well. Okay, the, the next question once whenever I do this presentation is asked, okay, so now we have this, we have looked at that, and this is just the same guy, Tom, who we started with. Now he's looking at how much this is gonna cost me. Okay, and that's where we go in and see what is the pricing for this. So different of different of a cloud comes in a different. Uh, I'll say it's it's a quite easy pricing model that we have. So if you go in here, uh, I'll go to to to. Sorry, I'll just go in here. So different of a cloud pricing is quite simple. So the CSPM, but what we talked about foundational, the three services that we talked initially is going to be free. So you will not be charged for the three services and those three services were. Uh -huh. Let me just bring it in here and I will show you that. Go back. Yeah, yeah. The three services we had is continuous assessment, security recommendations, and any misconfiguration or weaknesses, and secure scores. So for these three, basically, you will not be charged anything. That comes pre-canned. You can go in Defend of Cloud, and you can see that. Okay. The next thing is Defend of Cloud CSPM, which gives you the additional four functionalities: the attack path uh, analysis and other good stuff, which basically comes in and every billable resource it's 0 0.07 and that's basically going to be on your subscription for servers you have different plans so you have plan one plan two which comes with the different functionalities if you want to go with uh, a full blown of edr service or not and uh, or th there's differences that you can see on the microsoft website so based on that you can decide on the pricing over there same goes for containers databases so the reason behind structuring this is basically the pricing is quite granular. So what you see here is every service that you onboard. So let's say if I am onboarding here, this is my post subscription. OK, I'll just zoom out a little bit. So don't judge me with my secure score here. I have nothing in this one. So we can see here. OK, uh, did, 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 uh, security posture. So security posture of my environment of this Visual Studio subscription and uh, Payos Ego subscription, the, these four, three, four subscription that I have is why well, I have only three, four uh, resources. And based on that, it says it's 43 percent. OK, and you can always track your secure score over time. So you, you can actually see uh, five months back. My secure score was like 550 and now I have 75. So you can always Take that to your management and show them, OK, this is how it is working and we have that. OK, same uh, we OK here. So this is the screen that I was showing earlier, which is more around Defender for Cloud coverage on a different uh, services. So let's say there is one unprotected service. You can always go if it is Azure environment. I have in this example VM. I can go in. I can just do fix. And what it will do is configure a third part. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Just because I don't have licensing on this one, that's why it is uh, not giving me option. Otherwise, you'll be able to fix that. And there is another option. Let's say you have 
already installed something or maybe you you don't want to do that you don't want to show this in into into your environment or uh, affecting your secure score you can always go and say exempt when you do an exempt you need to sh you need to make sure uh, you give a proper reasoning over here if the risk is accepted or if you if it is resolved by a third party service and based on that uh, it will actually more remove that from the recommendation and you will not be seeing this again and again propping in your recommendations as well. OK, now the final piece here is I'll go back here. And where we. So we were talking about the cost, so everyone is happy with the cost. I will go in. Here, yeah. So the costing is quite granular, so now the three roles, the three, three a major security roles within the organization, right? So the org Tom has made a decision. We are moving to cloud and we are going to use Defender for Cloud. And that Defender for Cloud, what exactly it is going to give a satisfaction to our CISO here, who is going to get all the dashboards visualized, secure score tracked over time, and even a top level view of multi cloud state at one place so you'll be able to see or what is happening what all things are there if there is any gaps the security admins okay who is working day in day out on the overall environment they will be able to do a hardening of the overall environment based on the recommendations they can set up <coughs> sorry they can set up a proper policies overall the environment they can track if there is any vulnerabilities and also they can get a multi cloud inventory as well. So inventory, it can be a uh, use case as well of this. The security operations team will be quite happy with this. Once this is in place, you will be able to do a threat hunting quite uh, effectively. You will be able to see if there is any required, if there is if there is any breach, if there is, a, then where is the vulnerability coming from? What is the workload set that they need to specifically uh, uh, isolate in terms of making sure we are mitigating the threats. So the major security roles will be quite happy with the implementation of Defender for Cloud with all the stuff uh, with all the specifics. OK, yeah, that was, I believe, the end from my side. Uh, now, if there is any questions. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much, Tushar. It was a perfect session. Learned a lot uh, about all about the defender security. Thank you. Thank you so much. We um, have. <clears throat> I think we have several questions in the chat. I don't know, Tushar, if you have access to the chat, then I think oh, you can yeah. go through uh, them one uh, by one. I guess we have one hand raised from Navid Ahari. Uh, Ahari. Uh, if if uh, Navid, your uh, mic is now enabled, you can also ask your question by enabling your microphone. I think he had okay. Yeah, okay, it was so, a reaction, not not raised. Okay, hand. It's okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that's fine. Uh, I'll just go in with uh, OK, the question. So we have what what's the major difference between Defender and Purview? So these are on totally like a separate products. So Purview is more of your data security product. So wherein you put in Purview has inside of risk management, DLP policies and 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 all the good stuff around making sure your data is secure. Defender is basically making sure your workloads are secure. So if you have an app server running, your database is running those things and your overall environments. OK. Uh, and even from Purview, and I, I believe someone has answered that Purview is more around M365 perspective. So I'll say it, it's yes or no, but yeah, it, it covers from more of a data security. OK. Um, did you do what's next? Uh, OK, is it possible to integrate Azure Open AI with Defender, for example, storage for Defender and to improve its functionality and make it smarter based on 
out of specific usage. So if, if you mean like a making uh, Defender smarter integrating with Azure OpenAI that Microsoft is doing it from really long. So, so Defender is basically built, has a built in AI engine which it uses moving uh, uh, for specific security issues and making sure it is continuously getting updated. So Defender for Blow, uh, I have, a, uh, I'm not sure on Neutronic support. Uh, to share is disconnected or might have yeah. some connective issues. Yeah. Yeah, it, it should be a kind of connection issue. No, it's will wait. Uh, I'll come back. Yeah, I will come back. Let me check with him. Sorry guys, somehow my team's crashed and I got kicked out of the call. Okay. So where were we? Uh, someone said, sounds like Defender for Cloud Apps. So Defender for Cloud Apps, we can, we can definitely say it's a Defender for Cloud Apps, but it is different just because Defender for Cloud Apps is a product of its own by Microsoft. So that's for more of your uh, any applications like your M365 applications, your self SharePoint and other stuff. That's basically a different that's basically gets covered by uh, different for cloud apps. But uh, definitely it is for your applications sitting in clouds. And on prem and different clouds. So it's more of a hybrid cloud scenarios as well. OK, is there any service that provides insights regarding uploaded services, not Azure service? I mean, something like scan an analytics of .NET project hosted in app service plan. So you, you have a, like Defender for DevOps, which is basically going to give you and uh, your .NET projects. It, it's going to scan your .NET projects and give you uh, issues with your code. Then once it is deployed on an app service and if there is any vulnerabilities on the app service itself, it's not going to tell you if there is any issues in your login code. Yeah, but it's definitely going to tell you if there is that app service itself can be uh, exploited. OK, anything else? Uh, did I miss anything? Uh, there is one more and it's from Navid Ahari may do this workflow automation of security center by infra infrastructure as code oh, infrastructure as a code uh to be honest i have never tried to configure defender by infrastructure as a code that we, that's that's on my end uh but this is something that i have to go back and check if we can do but pro but most probably you can do that with bicep uh, you can go with most of the extensions and everything that will enable it automatically. But uh, the workflow automation piece, I have never done it myself. Might be possible, yeah, to to adjust the configurations like using Bicep or Terraform. Yeah. But, but uh, logically, there is no any resource to be deployed like using yes, yes. Impress, uh, Impress code. Exactly. Before we go for next question, we have Mohsen here. He has question yeah. too. Go go for it, Mohsen. Uh, I too have two questions about your experience and what is the best practice. The first one is it uh, did you uh, enable Microsoft Defender for uh, development environment? You just enable in the production. What's your experience? So, yeah, because so. because because the next question, uh, as you know. The some resources like my uh, Defender for storage is not a uh, resource based class management, it's a subscription. For example, you have a lot of, for example, 10 storage icons in your uh, development subscription. When you uh, available, enable Defender, all of the storage cover for cost. No, but no, uh, I, I'll correct you there, right? So if I'll. I can share my screen again. So Defender for Storage basically is is covered per storage account basis. So I Defender know. for Storage, uh, yeah. 
You can uh, come venue in Yeah, yeah, yeah. Venue enable. Let me check. I think is uh, is not is not possible to select which uh, storage can to cover the defender. You know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that basically is derived from your first question, right? So most of uh, I I can I can check that piece, but most of the thing is when we are looking at development environments and when we are looking at production environment, right? Yeah. Mostly uh, if it is not a very well governed, and I haven't seen like a single organization with very that much governance in place, right? Where you are generating all the dummy data in your uh, development environment. There is always like sometime there is an ask, OK, can you do a historical dump from your uh, previous environment to this? like a production environment to this uh, development environment so that we can do a testing, OK? And if the data is not cleansed and everything, right, you are always at risk there. And also, if you have the different, so let's say we, we, let's say we talk about defender for storage or defender for uh, endpoints. So if you're even if you're uh, we, we take the dev test quite lightly, but your dev test, if it is not totally segregated environment, OK, so once uh, the same attack path analysis methodology comes in here, one vulnerable virtual machine sitting in your environment can exploit all your overall until your uh, on premises and third party clouds as well, wherever you have the connectivity. So once the attacker gets in there, it can sit in that virtual machine, look for like a, because any attack that happens, it doesn't happen overnight. So attackers get into your machines, your environment, they sit for at least a good amount 15 20 days of time look for all the possible loopholes and they can then traverse they can they can do the lateral movement everywhere so for dev test definitely i'll say uh, you can definitely for servers and all basically you you can go with the lower plans which is plan 1 not going for yeah. plan 2 with more of adr functionalities and everything but definitely you should have coverage on that as well yeah, I, I check now uh, in the defender a storage account is not too possible to select which storage account you want to cover the defender. Yeah. Oh, yes, I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. I just realized. Yeah, so for storage account, yes, you cannot do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And the last, uh, my question about the uh, Defender for Endpoint, uh, how to cover, uh, as you can see in the Defender portal, you see mm -hmm. the uh, Endpoint device, you added uh, your organization for enterprise organization. Uh, sometimes you need to add the detailed device and this uh, monitor disclosure vulnerability. How to update uh, third party application like Adobe, uh, other application is started the uh, user device. So uh, uh, first thing is Defender for Endpoint is yeah. it, it comes with the M365 suit. OK, it's, it doesn't come yeah. with the Azure suit first thing. And uh, from the application, like it's more of Defender for Endpoint, you need to uh, do the signal monitoring which is basically and also uh, allowed apps. The Defender for Endpoint has at this point of time a lot of, I'll say, there is a lot of uh, limitations on that. So even mm -hmm. from even from web protection and everything, and I'm, I'm actually working with a customer right now, and uh, yeah. well, I'm, I'm in the process of implementing the same, but it comes out uh, there is a couple of limitations. But uh, you, your question is specific about Adobe or something. Could you repeat that again? Or is this connected? Your question is uh, specific about any application itself or? Uh, yes, it's a third party uh, third part application in the Defender endpoint uh, in the disclosure vulnerability. Is it covered in the Defender uh, portal? The third party application vulnerabilities, no, it's not covered. It, it is very limited. Yeah, so it, it cannot. For that, I believe you need to go with uh, there is app scans available. So you can go with that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Cool, uh, I think we have uh, two more questions. One, I think you already answered, but since you disconnected, uh, Ehsan couldn't uh, actually hear uh, what, what was your answer. So first of all, Darren asked, uh, can the just-in-time access for VM work with Peem? Just in time access works with. Uh, yeah, it's like relation between just in time and PIM. 
So just in time, so th th these are these are two different pieces we are talking about. So when one th one side you are talking about a network access, and one side you are talking about enrolled. Okay, so you can definitely you can definitely provide a role to someone who can access that simple. So if you have access to that, you can go in and activate the just uh, the just in time. Exactly that exactly. Uh, okay, so let's back to this question. Uh, uh, Ehsan ask which VM vendors are supported by MS Defender for cloud? Does it include it uh, Nutanix VMs? So uh, there is there is a list of all the flavors that uh, Defender for Cloud supports. The Nutanix is there or not? Uh, that's what actually I answered last time as well. That it's I'm I'm not hundred percent on that if uh, Nutanix is in there in the list, but. Uh, Based on best of my knowledge at the moment, I, I, I don't think so. No, Nutanix is in there, but the other flavors of Linux and, and uh, Windows is in there. OK, great. Uh, Hamid, do we have any more questions? Or I if... don't have any more questions, so we can go to the uh, choosing for the voucher. So Tushar, uh, yeah. any questions you think? Is Choose the, the best question, please. Yeah, we will provide a 50% voucher for the exam. For the fundamental exams. Okay, that's that's a really tough one. The, all the questions are really nice. Um, do, do, do. okay. I believe the best question is going to be around uh, the workflow automation with infrastructure as a code. If we can do that or not. Who, yeah, who because that's who has. Uh, has uh, I think it's with Navid. Navid Ahari. OK, yeah, great. So just one question. If someone here in this session was previously also what uh, in, in previous sessions uh, got a voucher because Microsoft Learn has limitations on these vouchers we are providing. Uh, so per user, we can just provide one voucher. So if you previously had a voucher uh, from the Microsoft Learn sessions and if you provide it now, so it won't work. So just let us know so then we can um, arrange the voucher for you. Uh, so perfect, amazing. Do we have any more questions? OK, so the session will be available on uh, Azure Zero to Hero YouTube channel and then will be published uh, in the channels, uh, in social channels like LinkedIn, uh, Twitter and also learning rooms. Uh, and the next sessions actually we're planning, so most probably we'll be hosting the sessions on a StreamYard rather than Microsoft Teams. And from there, it will be streamed to multiple platforms. So just making it easier for everyone using any kind of platform to access the sessions. So just for information, anyone in this session. And soon uh, the Microsoft AI 900 and AZ 900 training sessions will be started. Uh, hey, great. Thank you for everyone for joining. Thank you, Tushar, for the great session. Thank you really so much, everyone. It. Thank you. Thank you, Tushar. Have a yeah. good rest of Have your day. day. Bye, bye. Cheers. Bye bye. bye. Take care. Bye.